Hi, everybody. This is the art of art leadership. In case you forgot where you're at, this is the 2015 IGDA Leadership Summit. Thank you all for being here. So first, who am I? Why am I telling you things? I'm Heather. If you call me Heather and Dec Decker in person, it might be weird, so just call me Heather if you run into me. I'm presently known officially as the lead technical artist at Zynga in Chicago, where we work on Hit It Rich, which my mom really loves, social casino slots, good times. I'm also the chair of IGDA Chicago, which is the Chicago chapter of this glorious organization. And we do fun things in the Windy City with our community. Uh, previously, I was a technical artist at a startup that had been actually acquired by Zynga. Um, Spooky Cool Labs was a scrappy startup where we were working on a 3D city builder in Unity. Um, I was also an indie contractor, um, gun for hire with some small remote teams, things like uh, iPhone games, a couple things like that. Um, I spent a little time digging around in academia. Um, did some stuff there, and then predominantly had a lot of rampant volunteerism in my life. Um, did some stuff with alt dev blog a day, virtual conferency stuff for uh, you know alt dev summit. Um, also lots of IGDA stuff. I helped with one of the other IGDA summits and just tons of stuff with the IGDA. Goodness. So yes, I've done some things. And also, why are we here today? Um, quick show of hands. Who is an aspiring leader? Yes. Very good. Who is already an experienced, awesome art leader? Awesome. Very good. Um, how about leaders in other disciplines? Great. Uh, something for everyone today. If you're hoping to be an art leader, I got some of that. Um, if you're already an art leader, maybe I got some different perspective. Maybe, maybe you'll like that. If you are a leader in some other discipline, now you can understand what the hell we're doing over in the art department, just a little bit, so that's good. What are some considerations on a daily basis for us? Um, so yeah, why is art leadership different than leadership in any other discipline? So at first, I was going to make you all like some kind of clever Venn diagram about it. Um, and oh yeah, it's like leadership at large, but then it also has its own things. But then there's this large section of overlap and, and we can illustrate that. Surely we can illustrate that. Um, but then I got to thinking that this isn't really a very accurate picture of what art leadership is. It's, um, it's really neat and surgical and um, no. Uh, so then I set out to make a more accurate one. And it's like, all right, well, art leadership is mostly all the skills of general leadership. But then it's also some other weird stuff that's specific to creatives. Um, but this doesn't really look like a Venn diagram anymore. So that kind of defeats the purpose of what I was up to. So I made you something even better. This is what it really feels like. So you have your foundation of good, logical, organized leadership skills. Um, that are common to basically all of your management disciplines. And then we have this like explosion of weird creative specific things that kind of hinge off of that, maybe like a parasite in a way, I don't know. It's, and, and that's really what art leadership looks like if I was to make some kind of chart about it. Um, this, by the way, is a new chart classification. Um, we could call it an exploding extension diagram or something like that. I don't know. But anyhow, what am I going to talk about? Some of the uh, unique issues that arise when we're working with uh, creative types. It's kind of an overview of what we're going to go through today. Um, and I think I have some insights that may benefit you overall. Um, here's a quick disclaimer, though. If you're lucky, you are blessed with an amazing, diverse team full of different personalities and different skills and different strengths and weaknesses and they're vibrant and that makes them awesome. Um, but that's precisely what makes this hard. Also, everyone is different. So I can tell you a bunch of stuff, but fundamentally no one team is the same. And maybe some of this stuff applies to everyone on your team. Maybe some of it 
applies to a few people on your team. Um, either way, some of it's probably going to apply to somebody you know on your team or otherwise, because I'm going to cast the, the net like just wide and, and see what all we can cover. Oh yeah, everyone's different, like these crayons. So first off, um, by nature, artists are very visual creatures. They have um, visual minds, right brain, left brain stuff we could talk about all day. Um, some people like to talk numbers, sure. Some people like nice, fancy written descriptions. But at the end of the day, everybody who's an artist or has an artistic mindset, a right brain mindset, uh, wants something to look at in front of them. So this is something we definitely need to keep in mind when we're trying to guide and communicate with artists. And um, since everyone's different, uh, usually visual thinkers operate better with visual guides. They don't necessarily want some kind of big block of text. So if I'm going to come at you with like a bunch of specs, um, say I'm, I'm giving you all these, you know, oh, I need a 200 by 100, blah, 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 blah. Look, this is just a block of text. Uh, a lot of artists are just like, ugh, at this. Um, some, again, everyone's different. Some will think that's fine. But I think it's a little more effective when I, when I turn this into some kind of visualization for the team where, hey, this is a pixel perfect guide and it has exactly where you can and cannot do things and it has labels and colors and, um, and it's a little more friendly to work with than a big block of text and numbers. Um, but the important thing about guides is that you have to be like militantly accurate with them. I mean, people are using these um, to produce accurate work. You want the work to be accurate, you yourself have to be super accurate, triple checking your guides, making sure that you're leading by example. Um, then some other handy tools besides visual guides like this one, um, if you're giving people rough examples, uh, maybe you make some walkthrough videos if you have a really cool process. Um, again, since artists are visual, they, they want to watch what's going on, they want to see what's going on. Um, templates like this, they can dump down in Photoshop and work over top of even, and, and it just makes things a little easier. Um, than if you're, you're you know, spewing off a paragraph. Um, in short, visual direction is showing and not telling because, again, very visual people. Um, this is especially uh, relevant with remote work since, um, you know, you can, you can write an email all day long, but at the end of the day, you need a lot of examples and uh, different visual guides to, to help with your remote work since you're not right there. You're not down in the trenches with your remote team. Um, and um, some of the uh, different tools you might work on here. Uh, hey, I could, I could tell my team or my remote team all day long that I have a style in mind. It's better if I have visual reference. I'm showing them what's going on. Um, I can say, hey, I can send something back to somebody, whether they're remote or they're on site, and say, hey, you know what? This doesn't fit in my template. What's going on? Um, it's a little better if I actually throw that down and show what's wrong with it rather than just telling. Um, then, then it's a little more straightforward when they go to make corrections and, you know, they can see exactly what's going on at a glance. Um, it's also important to use any kind of visual cue you can, anywhere you can, always. So red, red's a big thing that jumps out at you. Use that when something's really important. Bold, red. Oh, Jira does a good job with that. Oh my god, that thing is definitely important because it's red and huge and has a giant number one on it. Um, flag your really important messages in Outlook with, there's a reason they use a little exclamation mark next to something that's important. Um, when you have corrections to make, maybe it just take a second to doodle all over something and help illustrate what exactly needs to happen for revisions. Because if you come up and say, hey, that needs to pop more or you know, this part needs to be bigger and, and you walk away, you know, and again with remote teams, if you're able to send a little something, uh, visualize the problem helps quite a bit. So another um, thing that comes up a lot when working with artists um, as emotional creatures, as um, very passionate feeling individuals, um, is that, um, you know, again, with the visual minds, it's very important to them to connect with their teammates. So when you're, when you're working with people remotely 
It's really important to actually set up like a Skype call or some kind of video call. I don't care what software you use. Make sure your remote teams actually get to see each other and talk to each other and realize that they're, they're all people um, because that isn't you know, actually apparent with your, with your IM thing. Um, maybe I have somebody on Skype and I have their, their IM handle and maybe it's like cool gal 61 or whatever. I don't, I don't know. That doesn't resonate with me. Especially if like her hand, her profile picture is like a, a, a kitty or a cartoon character or something. I'm still not really feeling that that's a person. When, when you have that Skype call and you see them on the video. If you can't do that, do, do a voice call. Just get everybody together and make sure that they all are seeing and visualizing each other as a team. Um, emails and IMs and everything are going to be important on a day-to-day -day basis for you to get through your basic tasks, but it's good to make sure you have regular time when everybody's actually connecting in a more um, tangible, visual way, in a more emotive way, really, because you know, at the end of the day, when you sit down, you have a video or a voice call, you're, you're getting a little more out of it, usually. And also, it can be kind of rough when you have people spread all over the place, like when you're working with people remotely. Um, make sure that you're cultivating a sense of, of team. Don't, I mean, it's easy to fall into traps of, oh, those people over there, or, or whatever, you don't even want to word it in such a way. Like, our team in blah, not the folks in blah. Like, we're all, we're all one big, happy art family, and, and you want to be, like, the big advocate waving that banner for everybody to, again, make sure all of these highly emotional, you know, creative people are just feeling the love. So... Additionally, um, it's kind of easy to get caught up in the grind as, as a leader, a manager, um, even, even as a producer, what, whatever your role might be. And, and you might get so focused on deadlines that you kind of lose track of what's going on with everybody. Um, it's important to actually make the emotional bonds with your team as well. Like, stuff as simple as going to get a coffee in the, in the break room or, you know, Shooting, uh, shooting the shit about what's going on on TV or, or whatever in an IM chat if you're, if you're remote to the person. Just um, how was your weekend? You know, make sure you're, you're being a person, you're being personal, you're, you're caring about your team and expressing that. Um, know what they like and they don't like. Um, this is, you know, getting to know your team is, is really gonna help you play to their strengths and be able to detect when there's a problem or anything else like that going on. Um, you want to be right there with them in the trenches, like among them, and, and you're one of them. You're not like an overlord, some weird thing or person they don't understand, right? Um, use, uh, use empathy as well. Exercise empathy with balance, all right? Like um, empathy is, is, is tricky because you want to you wanna feel for everybody, and it's important to feel for everybody, but you also have to be aware of those little pitfalls where, you know, sometimes people get weird and maybe maybe they're they're playing you but most of the time people people are pretty um, pretty genuine for the most part use your best judgment but but make sure you're, you're having that empathy with your team um, if somebody's getting overwhelmed hey what can what can I do to help you are you blocked what can I do to unblock you I'm here for you um, it's important to connect on that emotional level um, like these beautiful majestic cats here be empathetic. Also, be hyper-aware of your team health. Um, being as artists are emotional creatures, anything that's wrong on your team is going to be amplified. Like, if there's some kind of unrest in a corner, some kind of, you know, back and forth, or, or somebody has a problem, it's going to be probably 10 or 20 times worse than it is on, on some other types of disciplines. Like, I've, I've stood back and observed it for a while now, and it's like, okay, that's a little more explosive than that over there. All right, just make sure you're keeping an eye, you know, again, with the connecting with people, make sure you're keeping an eye on the team health so you can catch those things before they become some kind of detrimental problem. And keeping along with team health, 
make sure everybody is sharing and being a team. Um, have them share their projects with each other on, you know, after hours, downtime, where, whenever makes sense. Make sure everybody is aware of what everybody's doing so they can, you know, encourage each other. Um, it's also good on an art team to look at art together. Um, you can all grow and, and explore new things and discuss art, which is, which is really healthy. Keep, keep going with your craft. Um, also engage in some team building activities with your team. You know, chatting with them uh, and getting to know them is great, but everybody gets a lot further when, you know, you play a game or you go out and actually experience each other outside of work. And again, that really helps with um, building your team. You don't have to do trust falls on each other or anything, but, but do something constructive together to, to kind of forge that, that team bond. Um, so, another one of uh, the challenges that comes up when, when managing artists is um, the constant battle between structure and creative freedom. So, we make video games, which are a technical product. Structure is mandatory when you're working on something that's built out of math and code and um, has very strict rules to work. Uh, in complete contrast, um, creativity thrives on new and exciting things and always pushing the boundaries and exploring uncharted territory. These things are kind of at odds with each other. Um, this is beautiful. This is, a, this is a 3D printed sculpture that's going on right now. They're pushing the bounds, but they still have to play by the rules of 3D printers. Um, so basically everything in the world can probably be chalked up in a flowchart of some way. I feel like this is kind of a similar area. Um, on one hand, you have your strict, rigid adherence to a structure. So I have my rules and everybody plays by them. And if we go into the extreme of that, everything looks the same. Everything fits in the box. Things are boring. There's not as much variety in the world. It looks sterile or like cutouts. So that's not really great. Um, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, if you just don't pay attention to the rules at all and you color outside the lines and everything's complete chaos, then the programming team probably hates you. Um, lots of people on the team probably hate you because everything is chaos. Um, so you don't want that either. You want to kind of find that happy little place in the middle where maybe you find creative ways to stick within the bounds while still exploring where all you can go with things. Um, there's some areas where you can't do this, obviously. Um, the App Store requirements for icons are one of these things. If you have a rigid requirement that is not budging, this is not the time to explore the, the new frontier of it. If you turn in some kind of crazy nastiness to Apple and your app gets bounced, nobody on the team is going to be happy. Um, but there are some areas where you can experiment. Like maybe you know that your buttons have to be a certain size. And maybe you, know, they, you can do some different things in that space. You can have some rounded corners, use some transparency, great. Maybe somebody's like questioning that. Like, hey, can I um, you know, creep outside of that a little bit? Can, can I make this a little more decorative? Does that break something? Um, you can do a little R&D if you have like a good, solid reason that this would be really awesome. Um, I would definitely start having the conversation on behalf of, of your team, like, hey, my team thinks that this would be really cool for our game. Can we kind of push that a little bit? Can we, can we break that rule a little bit? It'd be really awesome. And maybe, maybe it's great and, and you add some new variety to your game and it hurts nothing. Um, but if it does hurt something, I mean, you can always compromise with your team and kind of fit that thing back in the box. But it doesn't have to be an extreme one way or the other. That's basically it. Um, there's also um, a lot of passion on art teams, uh, being as they're all emotional and stuff. Um, so, optimistically, you can always find thing, uh, you know, opportunities for people to work on things they're super excited about. Sure. Um, they're not always going to get to work on things they're super excited about, though. That's, that's the trick. Um, in the real world, in commercial work, there's always going to be that project you give to one of your artists who's like, oh, <laughs> why have you done this to me? Um, and that's just kind of how it rolls. We've all, you know, seen those kind of things happen. 
in the real world. Um, not everybody can be super passionate about everything they touch. However, when an artist is super excited about the thing that you put in front of them, something super magical happens. It's just, it's just glorious. Um, so try to strategize whenever you can um, to put, pa you know, put people's passion in front of them. I will, um, I will work my hardest to try to you know, juggle things around and find ways to, to connect the dots where, you know, again, back to talking to people and knowing what they're into, trying to, trying to connect people to the things that, that they're passionate about that I think they're going to shine at. Um, you want to work to people's strengths and give your team opportunities to, to thrive and, and do beautiful things. So try to connect them to, to stuff they're passionate about and, and majestic things will happen. Like clearly whoever did this Pokemon fan art was super pumped about Pokemon. You can tell by how beautiful and glorious it was. If they hated Pokemon, it would probably be less beautiful and glorious. Um, you can't always match people up to the things that they're super excited about, but, but you can sure try your best and, and make whatever compromises you can according to your schedule, right? Um, another common thing that everybody who's worked with uh, creative types is probably familiar with is egos. Back to that whole fiery passion thing we just talked about. Um, people get fiery in lots of ways. <laughs> so when you're working with super talented people, you're inevitably going to run across some egos. So what do you do? Um, really, you have to lead by example um, in the rough situations. Show respect at all times, even if somebody, you know, might not be displaying the greatest behavior. If you're always leading by example and you're showing respect and you're staying cool, then, then that neutralizes you know, that whole nasty situation. Um, and as a leader, try to cultivate harmony on your team anyway. Make sure that people are recognized for their awesome contributions. I mean, not everybody needs like a plaque all the time, but if you, if you take a moment every week or so to say, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so's work on blah was really great. What do you guys all think? Isn't that awesome? And, and kind of call out, you know, Various disciplines try to do this through things like the employee of the month and stuff like that, but just, just taking a moment and celebrating your victories as a team can go a long way to helping people who are very passionate feel that they're you know, adequately recognized and respected by the rest of the team, which helps keep the peace. Everybody, everybody wants to, um, I don't know, shine. Give everybody an opportunity to shine. That helps quite a bit. And also congratulate your team members who have grown. Have they, have they recently expanded their skills? Have they overcome something that was challenging? Oh, I threw so-and-so this project in a hurry and, and they totally crushed it. So well done, well done. You wanna always make sure that you're, you're recognizing people. And have some regular just feel good get togethers. Yeah, we all stand up and talk about schedules and what everybody's doing a lot because that's important. But every now and then it's important to just get together and be excited about the game you're working on. Like, why are we all here? What are we working on? Why is it cool? Get pumped. Get excited. That, that really helps um, bring the team together too and, and keep the feels going, the good feels, not the bad ones. So, art is hard. Basically, we are defining the intangible a lot of times. Art is not defined by strict logical rules. Um, it's just difficult because there aren't an, I, I've always been an art and a math geek at the same time, which makes me a freak of nature a little bit. So I'm going to come at this from the super logical angle for a second. Um, art, is, art is difficult because it's not defined by exceedingly rigid rules. So I have a programming example, basic, 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 basic stuff. Um, so um, maybe, some, maybe you're all familiar with what a Boolean is, right? So a Boolean, it's going to have to have a value that's either true or false. That's all it does. That is it. That is a very strict rule. It is one of two things. It is not anything else. The end. That's like a solid example of programming being super different from art, right? One of two things. No variation. It's always going to be true or false. It can't be all right. Um, I can't just kind of interpret my, my Boolean to be some other value. That breaks everything. It doesn't work. It's, it's, it's no good. 
Um, meanwhile, art, no, we don't, we don't have that. The whole game doesn't break if art doesn't follow some guideline. Um, it, we have the elements and principles of design and, and different stuff like that, but we don't have like hard and fast rules that you can always point to. Yes, no, on, off, zero, one, no, none of that. Um, it can be pretty subjective, actually. You can have heated arguments about art. Um, you can't have heated arguments about whether, you know, one plus one equals two, really. That's just kind of a fact. It is what it is. Um, so, may, like in this example, maybe I think that this text should be white for consistency. Or maybe the text should be green. Oh, maybe it should be blue. Maybe it's gaudy. Maybe it really stands out. Um, is this art inherently better than that art? We could debate all day long about it, but that, this, this is what I'm talking about. It's all wishy-washy, um, intangible stuff. Art is hard. We do have some tools that can help through this, right? Um, how do you stay sane? Yes. Comparison. You can use comparison. Um, this piece is darker than that piece. This has stronger line quality than that piece. Um, if you're having trouble defining what the kind of feedback you're trying to give somebody about their work on your team, try to pull some other pieces in and, and use comparisons to better communicate um, so it doesn't just become a I like this and, and you don't situation. Um, examples. Use examples of, um, like, like we were talking about before, with reference. Use examples like I, this style. This style really is vibrant. This style communicates this. Um, Everyone on your team may have a different perspective. Um, so while you all may have different tastes and art is subjective, definitely be open to solutions you didn't originally see. Maybe somebody has really brought something amazing to the table and you'll be surprised that, wow, that, that really can be bright gold and glittery and I never, I never thought that that would work, but it does. It's beautiful. So in conclusion, um, art leadership, builds from this, this foundation of, of core leadership skills that, that all of our managers know and love and, and practice, but it also has those weird considerations that you, that you have to go through um, due to the creative folks. And in short, for best results, you need to be pulling from both a foundation of, of logic and emotion to kind of build into that, forging order and chaos together to kind of balance and manage your team and amazing things will happen as a result as if you're if you're taking both of those powers and combining them so if you have any questions about art leadership stuff or any comments or opinions or high fives virtually uh, go ahead and send them to me on Twitter or my email um, we probably have like four minutes if anyone else has any questions but thank you so much for coming today